lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Today's show is five ways to amp up your gardening skills. And I promise I will not say something like go sharpen your gardening tools because we're moving beyond that. So stay tuned. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode and I think it will offer a lot of value to you. You know, the origin for today's show, how this show came about is I had a very good friend stop by unexpectedly a couple of weeks ago, and we started talking about gardening in 2017. And as I was walking her through some of the things that I do every year to get ready for gardening, she said, this should be a show. You should totally do a show on this. And so that's how today's show came about. And so I'm really excited to share this information with you, some of the things that I do every year to get ready for gardening. So that will be later on in the show. Now, I just want to say thank you as well to all of you who are sharing the podcast on social media with your gardener friends and family, because that's how podcasts grow. It's primarily through word of mouth. So thank you to everyone who is sharing the show with their gardening friends and family. And I hope that as the gardening season warms up, you remember to tell people about the show as a resource that can help them in their garden. You know, if you're new here, here. I'm Jennifer Ebling, and this podcast is dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. And I'd like to invite you to join our totally free listener community. It's a Facebook group that's just for listeners and guests of this show. It's a private Facebook group, and it's filled with gardeners who are very curious about gardening and have a passion to learn more. And it's a space not just for listeners of the show, but also guests of the show. And when I created the Facebook group, that's exactly what I envisioned. I wanted a space where listeners of the show could have easy access and interaction with the guests that have been on the podcast to help inform and inspire you. And it's this way that I was hoping we could continue the conversation and ask questions that some of the episodes might have triggered in your mind, or simply even if you just want to say thank you to some of the guests that have been on the show for providing such fabulous content and information. So go ahead, and the next time you're in Facebook, go to the search bar and type in Still Growing Podcast Group, and our group will pop right up. And then just request to join, because it's a closed group, you have to request to join, and then I will see your request and admit you into the group. Now, one of the other ways that you can easily get to the Facebook group is by going to my website. My website is sixfootmama.com, so it's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And if you go there, in the menu bar at the top is a link to the Facebook group, so it's an easy way to find the group without having to search through Facebook. Facebook can be a little confusing because it's difficult sometimes to find groups because when you do a search in Facebook, you get all the results. So you're going to see page page results. You're going to see people results, post results, and it all gets mixed together. So sometimes it can be difficult to find a particular group. You know, I have a page for the podcast, a business page on Facebook, and sometimes people go ahead and like that page, but that's not going to get you into the group. So if you're looking for the group in Facebook, make sure you type in Still Growing Podcast Group, and then make sure you're selecting the group, or just go to the website, sixfootmama.com, and you will see the group right there. So again, the website is the number six, ftmama.com, 
and there'll be a link right in the menu that will take you to the Facebook group. Well, speaking of the Facebook group, we had a number of new members join this week, and one of our current members, Rachel Diedrich, did a great thing. She went ahead and invited all of her gardening friends to join the group. So thanks for doing that, Rachel. I'm excited to meet your gardening friends in the group, and I hope they enjoy the show. So this week's new members include Laura Ivan, Stephanie Hayward Buffetti, Angelica Casimiro. Angelica has a homesteading podcast, so we connected this week. Jan Bujan, Cindy Freilinger, Jennifer Elsa Esser, Becky Freilinger, Kitty Meads, Frank and Linda Gossiak, Kathy McCowan, Lisa Haggis, Ruth Foos, Jason Ricketts, Igor Skoken. Igor was so wonderful. He reached out to me on my website in order to get into the group. So he was very persistent, and I just want to thank him for doing that. Christina Woods Ricketts, Carla Schaefer, Stephanie Wegscheid, Amy Jacobson Blysdale, Marsha Olson, Colleen Diedrich, Carrie Ann Montgomery, Kathy Jankin, Sarah Bedient, and Carrie Bellman Jen. Welcome, you guys, to the Still Growing Podcast group. You know, the group is also where I go to pick a lucky listener whenever there is a giveaway from a guest or sponsor. And this week, we actually have a re-gifting happen because Barb O'Brien had won a copy of Joel Karsten's Straw Bale Gardening book. And this was a few weeks ago. And she sent me an email and she said, Hi, Jennifer, I got your email that I won a copy of Joel's book. I already own the book. So maybe you could choose someone else as a winner. Thanks. Love your podcast. So that was really great. Barb is willing to give up her copy. And so I went to the Facebook group and Ann Wyden had commented on this post about Joel's book. And she said, I loved this podcast and the discussion. And so Ann Wyden, you are the new winner of Joel Karsten's Straw Bale Gardens book. And Joel was so generous, he gave away six copies of his book. It's a tremendous book. And that was a really fun episode. So go ahead and check that out. It's episode 556, and it was released on February 3rd. And Joel is one of the guests of the show that's in the podcast group. So if you have questions for him or want to reach out, you can find him in the Still Growing Podcast group. Now, in between episodes, I curate content. I'm always looking at garden news and garden information. And as I find that information, I share that in the group. And then every week on the show, I do a garden news roundup. So I go through some of the top things that I shared in the group. It's not a comprehensive list, but hopefully it will entice you to join the group. And my goal, again, is to help you and your garden grow. And I do that through education and inspiration. So let's go through the Garden News Roundup for this week. Again, these are just a handful of the posts that made it into the Facebook group this week. You don't need to take notes. If you join the group, all of the posts will be in the group. You can definitely access them there. You can also go to the website and see the links to all of these articles that I talk about in today's Garden News Roundup. We're going to start out like we always do with a guest update. Pam Pennick was on recently with her book, the Water Saving Garden. And during that discussion, she talked about her beloved plant, which was this wonderful whale tongue agave that had died as a result of blooming. And she wasn't quite sure what she was going to do in that space. And lo and behold, she found a replacement whale tongue agave. And she shared a wonderful post about replacing this agave on her blog, which is called Digging. And so if you just go to pampennick.net, that's her website. And then she shares this really great post about how she went and found this wonderful replacement agave. And I love how she started this out. She said, last weekend, after creatively wrestling with this bad boy to get him out of the car, my family helpers and I slid it onto a utility cart and rolled it into the backyard. And this agave was in a 15-gallon pot. 
which made planting, and, and Pam said, even unpotting a challenge. It's a fun post. And I think it also underscores the importance of having some signature plants in your garden. And for Pam, that means having a whale tongue agave, because after talking to her, I can't imagine her garden without this plant. In sustainability this week, there were two posts that caught my attention. The first was featured in the Washington Post. It was written by Barbara Damrosh, and it features a picture of Costas Christ, a writer for National Geographic Traveler and a founder of the ecotourism movement. And the article is talking about how you do not need a large plot to grow a bounty of vegetables. So that was very inspiring. And it talked about what you can do in just a very, very small space. And then there was also this really great post on seed starting troubles. This was actually a post from last year. It was in thegardenersworkshop.com and it was by Lisa Mason Ziegler. And she was talking about how to avoid common seed starting mistakes, which I thought was very timely in light of the fact that it is February and plenty of people are getting to work on starting their seeds in doors. In the sustainability segment this week, there were two posts. The first is an infographic that was shared by Q, the Millennium Seed Bank that's in Richmond in the UK. And the infographic that they shared shows the biggest threats that are putting the world's plants in peril. Don't forget that by 2020, Q aims to have 25% of the world's plants preserved at their repository. This was an absolutely fascinating graphic to look at. From a perspective standpoint, there was a great little post in the Washington Post that featured the gardener's little helper, dung beetles. This was a fun little perspective piece that shows that dung beetles are on the most lists of top helpful creatures in the garden, along with bees, earthworms, predatory wasps, and mosquito-eating bats. It's worth finding out more about what they do, especially since they're so helpful in the garden. And then I just loved this article that I found for the DIY segment this week. It was featured in southernliving.com, and it's called Here's How to Be That Friend Who Always Has a Beautiful Centerpiece on Her Table. It's fun, and it's so informative and helpful, and it's by Buffy Hargett Miller. In the plant spotlight this week comes to us through the CapitalHillsSeattle.com website, and it's talking about the jade vine that is blooming right now at Volunteer Park Conservatory. And the jade vine, also known as emerald vine or turquoise jade vine, is a species of woody vine that's native to the tropical forests of the Philippines. And it has stems that can reach up to 18 meters in length. It's extremely spectacular. And they show a picture of their blooming jade vine. This is a freaky plant. The leaves are an alien green And it's very peculiar. It requires a constant flow of warm, wet air and at least two years to reach maturity. So you've got to see the picture of this jade vine in bloom because it's something that you probably have never seen before. It's really crazy. And then the headline for this article was really funny because it was referring to this corpse flower that the conservatory had tried to grow last year. And apparently they had named this corpse flower Dugsley and the corpse flower didn't have a great result for them. They said in all caps at the end of the article that Dugsley, the corpse flower, let us all down big time by stopping mid-bloom and then quickly decomposing. So they're having much more success with their spectacular jade vine bloom. And again, this is at Volunteer Park Conservatory in Seattle. There were four posts that made it into the news segment this week. The first one is about how record drought and record rain are toppling trees. And we had talked about this earlier uh, in the year when we were talking about the giant sequoia tree that had the tunnel through it that had fallen over because of the record rains. And so this is not just a problem for some of the larger trees out west, but in just, I mean, trees in general. I thought this article was helpful that was in the LA Times because it gives tips for how do you know if your tree is in trouble. 
And it cites the work of arborist Rebecca Lotta, who says to look for changes in the soil near the tree root. She said, if I see cracking in the soil next to the trunk, then I'm very concerned, especially if the homeowner says it's new, because she says that indicates that the tree might be moving. So lots of great advice in this article. That's just one of the things that she says to look for. EcoWatch.com shared a really fun post about the 100 greenest cities in America, and you can look up where your city ranks. And then there were a number of outlets reporting that Japan has created something that's called coffee butter. So this means that people in Japan can basically spread coffee on their toast in the mornings. So apparently this is an idea that was created by Meg Milk Snow Brand, one of the largest dairy companies in Japan, and they're marketing it. It's in this very cute little container, and they actually show a piece of toast with this schmear of coffee butter over the top. It sounds great. I think I need to try some. You know, it's basically a compound butter. So it's the same thing like when people take some of their herbs and then they mix that with butter and then they have rosemary butter or they have lavender butter. It's the same thing. They're they're incorporating coffee into butter and it looks very smooth and creamy. It doesn't look gritty. So I'm not quite sure how they put it together, but it's a compound butter. It's a compound coffee butter. Thank you, Japan. Well, I always think of gardeners as archivists of a sort. So when I ran across this post by ecgadget.com, I had to share it. And plus, I think gardeners love to use garden tools or different tools in the garden. So I thought you guys could appreciate this article. But this report shared this very interesting story. And it was all about this person that had uncovered tools that had not been touched since 1941. So Dr. James E. Price, an anthropologist, archaeologist, managed to acquire a toolbox that is still filled with tools originally issued by the government in the United States in 1933 for the Civilian Conservation Corps, or commonly known as the CCC. And they said, this is a very rare find with great American historical significance. You know, which reminds me, my great aunt Frances in Michigan has the original box that the government issued her brother, my great uncle, when he joined the CCC in Minnesota. And the box was made to look a little bit like a suitcase. And inside it, it had the CCC uniform and all of the originally issued things that her brother needed to join the CCC. Anyway, I love articles like this. We get a chance to time travel. Well, there were two folks that made it into the dream guest segment this week. And these are folks I'd love to have on the show, folks I'd love to interview. And the first one was featured in a Canadian newspaper by Sandy Coleman. And she's talking about Bruce Bennett and his herbarium, which has internationally become known for having one of the most extensive collections of Arctic plants. And it's all stored in his cozy basement. This is a really wonderful article. And then there is a Brazilian brewer that's making beer out of $20,000 bonsai trees. So in Brazil, there is a small brewery that's called Heroica, and they're relying on a bonsai master to provide some of the exquisite ingredients that they're using in their brewing process. So Heroica's beers not only combine hops, barley, and yeast, they also use branches of centennial Japanese bonsai trees. And it says in the article that for some of the recipes, the pruned branches come from trees that can cost more than $20,000 U.S. And the idea came from Renato Bocabello. So he's my dream guest in this article. And he's one of the biggest bonsai masters in Brazil. And it's kind of an interesting story. His brother-in-law began making his own beers when Bocabello gave him a home brewing kit as a gift. And then he got the idea to try bonsai trees after he had tasted some beer that had been infused with branches of Japanese black pine. And he said that he noticed some similarity to hops flavors. And he began to wonder how a beer made with bonsai pine branches would taste. 
taste. So they created this beer that's called the Kuramatsu Kamikaze IPA. And apparently Scandinavian people have been using pine instead of hops to make beer throughout history. So Bocabello is apparently pruning his more than 400 bonsai trees twice a year, and he ends up with many pounds of these precious leftovers that can be used in the IPA recipe. And these are pretty special trees. His Kuramatsu trees were a gift from a third generation member of a Japanese family that came to Brazil in 1912 And that's how he sourced his bonsai trees. So two great folks for the Dream Guest segment this week. In Science This Week, there was an article that was shared in greenbiz.com and also by the BBC. And it features a new study that was in the journal Nature. And it's exploring a vicious cycle because as the changing climate warms the planet, the soil is heating up. And then the microorganisms that live in the soil start to expel carbon dioxide, which is reinforcing the problem of climate change. That's a worthy read. In the shopping category this week, there were four posts that caught my attention. The first is this fantastic bird photo booth, and this was shared on MyModernMet.com. So apparently there was this woman named Lisa who moved from Germany to Macomb County, Michigan, and she was completely enthralled with all of the new birds that she was discovering at her Michigan home. And so she was looking online for something to add on to her her digital camera, and she stumbled on this bird photo booth, which is a seed dish that doubles as a camera, and she's getting these amazing close-ups of these birds that are visiting this seed dish. So that was very inspiring. When I shared it in the group, there were a lot of people that were interested in getting their hands on one of those. Next up was this post that was shared by FuryMix.com, and they feature this silver stainless steel pineapple peeler, pineapple core, pineapple slicer. It's all together in one little handy gadget, and I watched the video about how they do this, and it's fascinating. It's wonderful. It reminded me of the apple peeler core slicer, except you're doing the same thing with pineapples. So that's really cool. If you're a heavy duty pineapple user, this will be something that you'll want to get and you probably already have one. This next article came from an interesting source. It was featured in mensjournal.com. And the headline was, put down the binoculars. This app can identify birds by song. So there's a new app that's called Song Sleuth. And in essence, it's Shazam for birds. You know, the Shazam app can recognize any song and then tell you the name of the song and then who's singing it. Well, it's kind of the same thing for birds because you use your iPhone or iPad to capture whatever birds are nearby that are chirping and where you need to have identification. And then Song Sleuth runs that audio through a set of algorithms and then displays the three most likely bird species behind that sound. So this is a really fun app. I am going to download this and then just sit out on my deck in the morning in the spring when the birds are going to town and identify all the birds that are around me. I just am very excited to try this. Okay, so I just looked it up on iTunes, and it's $9.99, and it's called Song Sleuth, Audio Bird Song ID with Sibley Reference by Wildlife Acoustics. So if you go to the iTunes, if you go to the Apple Store, you'll see it there, and it says, Song Sleuth turns your iPhone or iPad into a powerful bird song identifier for the United States and Canada, developed by Wildlife Acoustics in collaboration with the world-renowned bird expert and illustrator David Sibley. The app features on the ability to automatically recognize the songs of 200 birds most likely to be heard. That's exciting. All right. And then to round out the shopping category, there was an article that was shared on Country Living by Lauren Smith, and it's called 10 Strange But Also Beautiful Houseplants You Never Knew Existed. And they said, we want one of each. They are really cool. 
The pictures in this post are very inspiring. So I'm sure there'll be plants on there that you've never seen before. The fire stick sedum is in there, that one I've seen. And I've seen the Medusa's head, that succulent that they usually mount to a piece of wood and then have it look kind of like antlers coming out. Those I'd seen before. The one that I want is one that's called the wine cup plant because each of the blooms, the way the leaves are formed, becomes this little wine cup. And it grows up to be about six inches tall when the flowers in bloom. So it's kind of cool, but you've got to see the pictures. These are really, really awesome plants. There were plenty of posts that made the inspiration category this week. There was a top seven landscape design trends for 2017 that was featured in the nest.com. There was a post that was called how to design the entertainer's yard. And that was in sunset.com. And then there was another post that was called 10 ways to get a designer garden without the price tag. So this one was really great. Lots of good ideas. So all three of those were really wonderful. And then finally, Finally, I ended the segment with this really cool video that features a special place in Denmark. And so what it is, is it's a place that's called Verden Skortet. And it's a place you can go visit. This gentleman made a walkable map of the world out of soil and stone. I share the video in the group, and it's super cool. This is a project that was basically a labor of love by a gentleman that really loved geography, and he decided to lay out the entire world through shaping a small peninsula on a lake that he lived by, and he did it with the use of just a few simple tools, a wheelbarrow, a push cart, and hand tools, and then a lot of ingenuity. In fact, some of the stones that he single-handedly hauled for this project weighed more than a ton. So it was a true labor of love. The finished map measures 45 by 90 meters, and it's entirely to scale. So you get to go out to this property and walk out onto the lake and then start walking across the world. And that's the part I think is really amazing is you get a sense for the scale of the world. It's become a popular family attraction in the Viborg area in Denmark. Visitors can play mini golf along the shore and paddle rowboats in the miniature Pacific Ocean. It's a very charming sight. They said it's an Atlas Obscura if we've ever saw one. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup this week. Again, these are just a handful of the posts that made it into the Facebook group for the listener community for the show. If you're interested in finding that or getting links to all of these articles, you can go over to my website at sixfootmama.com and click on the show notes for this episode, or just go on over to the Facebook group and request to join. The Facebook group is in the menu at the top, and then just click on that link and request to join, and you'll be in the group, and then you will get a regular dose of helpful articles and inspiration to help you grow and learn as a gardener. Okay, I'm really excited for today's show. We're going to talk about five ways that you can amp up your gardening skills. You know, there's that quote that says, what you focus on grows. I'm going to direct your attention to these five areas so that you can grow in this area. So the first thing we're going to do is create a map of our garden space, of our property. And so how I want you to do this is through using modern technology. So initially, whatever your reaction was to the words, create a map of your property, if you started to kind of zone out a little bit or go to maybe a failed art class, something like that, I don't want you to worry. This is definitely going to be so easy. It's going to blow your mind and you're going to find it to be extremely helpful. So here's what you're going to do. First of all, you don't need a ton of special tools in order to have a map of your property. You don't even need to have an artist stop by. You can do it all by yourself now with all of the wonderful things that are available on the internet. So the first thing I want you to do is you can either go to Google Maps and search for your property there, or you can go to an app that I found yesterday that's called scribblemaps.com. Now, Scribble Maps was created so that you could draw on a map. Now, 
I used their demo version. I used a free version, and I'm sure it's referencing the Google Maps images of my property. But I liked it because it was very up to date. We had just installed a path and a garden pit in our property last year. And sure enough, that was already showing up on the picture of our property. So it was great because it was super current. But all you're going to do is just use the free demo if you go to scribblemaps.com or just go to Google Earth and then search up your property. So when your property is brought up, you're going to see an image of your property, probably next to your neighbors and that kind of thing. What I'd encourage you to do, step one, is to take a screenshot of that property. Now, you if you're looking it up on an iPad or on your iPhone, you can simply do a screenshot that way. If you're on a Mac, if you're fairly tech savvy, you can kind of custom select that area, crop it, select it however you want. And I would encourage you to take a couple of different screenshots. So here's what I'm going to suggest. First, that you take a full width screenshot of the property so that you can show someone an overview, a bird's eye view of your property and in its entirety. So that's the first screenshot. And then the other screenshots will just be smaller views, smaller perspectives on your garden. So maybe it'll be, oh, here's the front garden, or here's the back garden, here's our side garden, what have you. And then you'll have a number of these images for the second step. And I just want to uh, caution you that there's an app that you're going to need to purchase probably to make the second step happen. And the app needs to be an app that can create a sketch from a photo. So the app that I like to use is called My Sketch. And what it does is it takes any photo and it turns it into a sketch. And it not only turns it into a sketch, you have a number of different styles of sketches to choose from. Some look extremely artistic. Some look like they could be in a magazine. Others are very rough. They look like maybe they were done by hand. There's a, there's just so many options once you get this app. So I get the app called My Sketch. It's available in iTunes. And the app name in its entirety is called My Sketch Pencil Drawing Sketches, and it's by My New Limited. My New Limited, M I I N U Limited. That's the one that I use. Holy cats, it's free and it's fantastic. Here's why I want you to do this think about it this way. You know, a couple of weeks ago, when Joel Carson was on the show, we were talking about all of the microbial activity that happens inside a straw bale. And Joel said to me, he goes, if we could view the garden through the lens of a microscope, think of you know how we would see our gardens differently. Well, through doing this activity, by getting a bird's eye perspective on our property, imagine the different way that you will think about your property. So here's what I mean by that. Imagine if you can do a rendering, a sketch of your property as it is today, and then create a new sketch, a sketch for how you want your garden to look in 2017 or beyond. That's very powerful because we don't think about our gardens or our properties in their entirety usually. We think about, oh, we've got this problem spot over here or we've got, oh, this area over here. But we don't have that bird's eye perspective. And sometimes that perspective could help us make better design choices. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. You know, when landscape designers get together at a restaurant or a bar after work and they sit around and talk, you can only imagine some of the things that come up. But I've done this before and you hear all kinds of things. One example always stands out in my mind and that is the placement of kitchen gardens or vegetable gardens. Because oftentimes we put them so far away, they're at the back of our property. And the farther away they are from the kitchen, the harder it is for us to get from the kitchen to the garden 
and go and harvest. Believe it or not, proximity is your friend. And so a lot of times I encourage my friends to consider if they have a situation like that where the garden is way, 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 way beyond the house to put a smaller kitchen garden up close to their house by the kitchen door so that their most commonly harvested herbs or veggies are right outside their kitchen door because proximity is your friend when it comes to harvesting on a daily basis. One of the things that I like to look at first and foremost when I see a map of a garden is whether or not the property is clearly defined and is the space enclosed. You know, the original term garden means enclosed space. And there's a reason for that. That enclosure really defines the space and it anchors the garden. It protects the garden, it anchors it, and it gives you a backdrop for design. If you're struggling in an area of your garden, you're not sure what to do, ask yourself, is that an enclosed area? Is there a fence? Is there a perimeter? Is there a defined boundary that I'm working with? Because if there isn't, that usually is one of the reasons why it's difficult to design in that space. Now, here's what I do with my illustrations, my sketches of my garden that are helpful to me. The first thing I do is I do create somewhat of a vision board for my garden, so an overall plan so I know where I'm going. And I have the map or the sketch of how my garden looks today, and then I create a new vision for my garden, a a totally new plan for the entire property. So if I could move everything around and reposition it for its optimal location, what would that look like? And the gap between where my garden is today and where I want it to be really dictates what I do in my garden during the year. Now, one of the ways that you can create a dream map for yourself of your property is to take that sketch that gets rendered by that one app, by my sketch, and just go through and white that area out. And then you can go ahead and then just draw in that area Area. So if you have a friend that's really handy on something like Canva, that particular app, you can go in and modify those areas or redraw those areas using a web-based tool like Canva, which is free. And if you don't want to use the computer, you can do it very easily by hand. Now, when I create printouts of my overall map, I like to create one that's about the size of two business cards put together. So it's a it's a small square. But then what I do is I fold it in half and I just slip it in my wallet right by my credit card, which is very conveniently placed, may I just say. So when I go to a nursery or a greenhouse or a grower and I'm looking to get their input on what to do or where to plant something, I can just pull that map out and show them, hey, this is my property. This is north. This is south. This is the area that I'm talking about. Um, it's wet. It gets great sun. It, you know, whatever the conditions are. And they can start to see where I'm going with my design and what in particular I need from them in terms of help. Maps are so important to design. They're foundational. So that's why Creating your map is the very first thing I think that's essential for any garden if they want to amp up their gardening skills. It's going to help you think about your garden in a much more strategic way. The second way I think you can amp up your gardening skills is to be strategic about how you're spending your time in the garden this year. Now, if you have any athletes in your life or if you're an athlete yourself, this will be very relatable to you in terms of a concept. And it's to think about your time in the garden with a specific purpose in mind. And I've broken it into five different classes or kinds of days in the garden. And it really helps me when I'm in the garden and when I'm working with my student gardeners. And the five days that I use are weed day, seed day, love day, lug day, and dream day. And I'm going to walk you through these. So again, the inspiration for this idea came from working with my kids or helping my kids as they are growing to be better basketball athletes. 
So PJ will often say, oh, I'm not going to miss leg day. I've got to go do my leg day. And he'll go to the gym and he'll work on leg strength and speed strength and or speed activities, things like that. And when this started happening, I just I kind of chuckled because it's, you know, it's hilarious. It's funny to hear somebody say, oh, it's a, don't skip leg day. We got to work on that. Or it's ab day, that kind of a thing. But what it's doing is it's helping him get closer to his goal of being a better basketball player. And I started thinking about it in terms of gardening when I would go out to the garden and start working. And the next thing you know, All I had done was basically weed for about four hours. It's not very life-giving to have endless days in the garden where you don't get the things accomplished that you want to get accomplished, and you're tired and you're crabby, and it's just you don't feel like you're getting that momentum. So by labeling these days... I found I've been able to get a lot more done. So I'm going to walk you through them. The first one is the obvious. It's a weed day. So when I go out there for weed day, I'm not putting a ton of pressure on myself other than I need to weed. Now, for some people, weed days are every day. They love those kinds of days. They can go out there, commune with nature, feel like they're tending and nurturing their garden, which they are. But there's not a lot of thought involved, right? We're just sitting out there and we're weeding. We're we're trying to keep the garden clean and help the plants grow. And it's a very laborious job. In fact, it's such a miserable job that the California legislature has banned farmers from requiring hand weeding of their workers. So think about that. Yanking weeds while bending, squatting, or kneeling is so onerous that the California legislature has banned that for farmers from requiring it from its workers. It is a tough job. And I often really grimace when I see posts from gardeners who say, I need kids to come to my garden and weed because it's really limiting the kind of help that you can get in the garden. I think that you can require more of kids. You can get more help from kids or people that are in your garden than just weeding. That can be just as beneficial. And we're going to be talking about that more as well. Now, I'll share with you my two favorite tools for weeding in the garden. One is the garden rocker, which gives me a place to sit without squishing all the plants underneath. It rocks, it pivots, it moves with you, and it has a very small footprint. And I think I recommended it in my gardener gift guide for 2016. That was my episode in December. And then also the dig it. The dig it is my favorite tool for prying weeds out of the garden. And if they don't sell it in a nursery nearby, you can just go ahead and order it online, which is how I get mine. So if you can imagine during the week that you would spend one day a week on weed day where you're just going out with the mission of simply pulling weeds... That would be a more strategic use of your time than just ambling out to the garden without a particular purpose on any given day. So I like to have a designated weed day. The second kind of day that I refer to often is seed day. And seed day is an exciting day because it usually involves the kids and we are planting. So whether we're planting seeds or we're succession sowing or we're planting new plant material in the garden, it's usually pretty exciting. Now, the key is to designate your plant days, your seed days in the garden. So I always give the example of gardeners that go out and buy a, you know, a van full of plants, just like I do, and then fail to plan time on the calendar to get those things in the ground. So I don't want to get distracted by weeding or other activities in the garden. I really designate seed days on my calendar when I get my plant material or when it's time to plant seeds. And then that's all I do when I'm out there. And I try to do it in short bursts of time so that I give myself a time constraint for getting it done. Seed days are fun days to experiment as well because you're sometimes growing new varieties or you're planting things that you've never planted before. And if you're looking for inspiration with that, I direct you to episode 552, my episode with Megan Phelps, the experimental gardener, or even just go back and listen to episode 557 with Megan Kane, the creative vegetable gardener, and you'll get a lot of inspiration for different things that you can plant this year in your garden. 
You know, another great tip during seed day is to plant some things in shade to slow down bolting. So for instance, when I'm planting lettuce with the kids, we'll start in the southern garden, the garden that gets the most sun, and then we'll gradually make our way to containers on the east and the west side of the house, places where there's not such intense sun and it slows down the growing season. And then they become familiar with the other areas in the garden where those edibles are being grown. So we've covered weed day and seed day. The next type of day is my favorite type of day, and it's the day I always tell gardeners you cannot skip. If you do one of these a week, you'll have, you know, maybe 16 of these days in your garden in any given season. I'm, you know, speaking, of course, from my Minnesota garden, but that's roughly about how many of these kinds of days that I get in a year. So when you think about it in those terms, it does not seem excessive at all. And I do not want to miss one of these days. And these are love days, love days in the garden. So we've got seed day, weed day, and now love day. Love day is a day where you're present in your garden and you are doing things to just enjoy your garden or to enhance your garden. You might be doing a a little project. They're not big in the garden. They're not going to be super taxing. This is about pleasure and enjoyment in your garden. And I encourage people to think about their garden the relationship they have with their garden in the same way they might think about their relationship with their spouse or a close friend. In order to tend those relationships, you do things like date nights or movie nights or coffee dates, things where you're just taking a break from the world and you're enjoying each other's company. And we should do the same thing with our garden. You know, and just like when we're with our spouse or we're friends, we could sit there and critique, you know, their outfit or their habits that drive us crazy, that kind of thing. But we don't do that on a date night. We don't do that when we're having a coffee date. All we do is bask in each other's company. And on love day, that's what you want to do in the garden. The weeds are there. Absolutely. There are things you're not going to like. But There's a reason you bought a bench for your garden. I guarantee you, you have a place to sit in your garden and you have to take the time and just enjoy the garden. Because if you don't, if you only see the garden as a place to work and toil, that's a real shame because the garden should be very life-giving. And we've all had years in our garden where all we did is work and we didn't enjoy our garden. And those are dog years. Those are not years that are very life-giving. And sometimes when we overwork ourselves in the garden and we take no pleasure in the garden, we end up stopping gardening altogether. So when it comes to love days in the garden, those are days when I designate them that are pretty sacred to me on my calendar. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that those days happen. You know, again, if you think about how many weeks your summer is or your spring or whatever your the nice part of your year is, you know, up here in Minnesota, it's not a very substantial amount of time. So if I can get just one love day in every single week, and it doesn't have to be an entire day. I'm talking about, you know, that day, whatever time I was going to spend in the garden is just truly a day to enjoy the garden. Then that's important to me. And and I'm going to do that no matter what. I might skip weed day. I might skip seed day. But I am not skipping love day in the garden. And I hope you don't either. Let me give you some ideas about how you can enjoy love days in your garden. And I'm going to give you a tip about a really cool book that I stumbled on when I was at Patina, which is a really wonderful uh, little gift store here in the Twin Cities. They featured this book uh, that was this cute little book. It's a yellow book, and it's called Instant Karma. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later in the show, but it's a great book for Love Day because it gives you all kinds of ideas. So Instant Karma talks about all these wonderful things that you can do to put good karma into the world. And when I was reading through the book, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a Love Day inspiration book because it's just chock full of all these ideas. And it's so cute. And it's such a sunny little book. And uh, it reminded me of that game the kids play when they get 
a, a fortune cookie and the fortune cookie, you know, will say something like, you know, you're uh, you're an ingenious person and your friends will admire you. And then the kids will usually add some phrase. So they'll say like in the bathroom, you know, to make it funny. And I was thinking you could look at this instant karma book and go through all of those suggestions and then add the words in the garden, like read a great book in the garden, enjoy some lemonade in the garden, whatever the ideas were in the karma book. I'm not doing it justice here, but you get the idea. If you're struggling for what to do, that book will be chock full of those ideas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later in the show. But there's this practice called earthing, which is a technique that is just very simple. And it's all about connecting with the earth. Because when you go barefoot, and you're connecting with the earth, you are anchoring yourself in the world. So on love day, I like to go out in my flip flops and be barefoot as much as possible. I might sit by my water feature and put my feet in the stream and have Sunny come sit by me and drink from the stream or take a bath, that kind of a thing, whatever's going on, but I'm really connecting with my garden. And I always like to tell my kids that connection is your protection. So when you are connecting with the garden, it's protecting you from all of the other activities that we do during our week that take us away from the earth. So whether it's spending time with the TV or on the computer, those very stimulating, draining activities can all be counteracted with time connecting to the earth. So that connection is our protection. You know, when I interviewed Shelley Cram, the author of The Gardener's Bible, when I asked her about when she spends time in her garden, she chuckled and she said, you know, it's lunchtime. I go out to the garden and I pick herbs and veggies and I make my lunch and I eat in the garden. So she has a standing lunch date in her garden on the days when she can do that. She's got five kids and she finds time to make her lunch and spend time in her garden. That's that's love day activity right there. And here's something else to consider. Throughout all of these interviews I've done over the past couple of years, I'm talking to seasoned gardeners. And one of the questions I occasionally ask is, what advice do you have for new gardeners? And I can't tell you how many times somebody will say, just go be in your garden, observe, be out there. And that's another important aspect of Love Day. It's where you're taking time to pay attention to the things that are happening in your garden. You know, on Love Day, I love to take my camera out and take pictures of my garden, the birds in their birdhouses the nests that are on the property, the bees that are working on the plants. And as I'm going through, I try to make sure that I have contact with the plants. So when I'm in the herb garden, I'm smelling the lavender and I'm I'm breaking off a stem and I'm crushing it in my hand. You know, research has shown that when you are touching your plants, when you're gently brushing the tops, having contact with the leaves, you're helping them develop. And research has actually shown that those plants end up having sturdier stems, especially if you regularly go through and brush the tops of your plants so that they have to move, that there's movement and connection there. Love Day is really important to me. You know, it's one of the reasons why we transformed our swing set, the kids' old rainbow play system, into a hammock set. So we have three hanging hammock chairs out there. And on Love Day, I usually find a way to end up in one of those hammock chairs on the kids' old rainbow swing set. And then we, of course, tied ropes to the top of the monkey bars that go across so that when I'm in that hammock chair, all I have to do is reach up and grab the rope and I can gently rock myself that way instead of having to swing myself with my feet. I can just curl up, hold on to the rope and pull myself with the rope. And one last word about Love Day. You know, love days in the garden are really important if you're a gardener and you have kids because you don't want the kids to see the garden through the lens of work. You want the kids to see the garden in a more full and complete way. And by incorporating love day into the garden, 
they can appreciate that aspect of the garden as well. And to me, involving them in Love Day activities in the garden is how I know they're going to be gardeners when they grow up. Okay, so we have Weed Day, Seed Day, Love Day, the most important day. And then I have a day that doesn't always happen, but it does happen occasionally. And this day is important because sometimes if you don't have a day like this, it can stop you in your tracks and the other days don't happen. And this is a day I affectionately refer to as Lug Day, or it's the equivalent of the leg day in the garden. And what I mean by this is that you are moving things in the garden. You are moving a tree. You are moving plants that need to get transplanted. You are moving boulders or big containers. Lug days are heavy days in the garden. And because they're heavy, because you're moving things that are pretty substantial, they can be stoppers. They can actually stop you from getting out to the garden altogether. Lug days are days where I often get help in the garden because I'm getting too old to move things like this and I have to conserve my energy now because I have four teenagers that I have to keep up with. In addition to that, I just found out I need to have rotator cuff surgery. So lug day is a day that's going to need to happen in my garden, but I'm not going to be doing the physical work of lug day. So just like with all of these other days, lug days are important because you have to calendarize them. You've got to get them on your calendar. If they're not there, it's just too easy to push off those big projects, to not schedule the help, to not get the work done. And that ends up feeding that cycle of frustration that can set in when you're gardening. So lug days are tough all around. They're tough to schedule, they're tough to line up help for, and they're tough to actually carry out. So this year, challenge yourself. Identify those days early on. What needs to get moved here? And then just handle it the same way you would handle paying a bill or any other home improvement project that has to get done. And if you have to, go ahead and schedule a love day in your garden that involves other people so that they can hold you accountable for your lug day. Let's say you were going to have a garden party. You were going to invite some girlfriends over or some friends over, or maybe you were going to host your book club in your garden. Well, just knowing those events are going to happen sometimes can make a lug day become a reality because you know you need to get that work done in order to have this Love Day event in your garden. All right, so we've had Weed Day, Seed Day, Love Day, Lug Day, and the last day is Dream Day. I was watching TV the other night, and there was this politician on, and he was quoting Mario Cuomo, who apparently said, you campaign in poetry, and you govern in prose. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's the same thing in the garden. You know, there's that quote that says, gardeners dream bigger dreams than emperors. And I thought, isn't that the truth? Because gardeners are dreamers. We're constantly thinking about the future when it comes to our garden. And I think we dream about our garden in poetry tree and we garden in prose. Dream days are important because they're what shapes the garden of our future. And dream days really help direct our activity in the garden. In fact, dream days can be just as important to our growth as gardeners as actually being in the garden. Let me give you some examples. Dream days are often where I'm planning garden visits or I'm actually going on garden visits. And I challenge myself throughout the summer to once a month go to a bigger private or public professionally done garden once a month during the summer. And then twice a month, I challenge myself to go to smaller gardens. These are gardens of my friends. But by spending time in other gardens... I'm better able to dream about what I want for my own garden. Whenever I'm visiting someone's garden, I always think of that famous quote by the British poet laureate Alfred Austin. He said, show me your garden and I shall tell you who you are. You know, when you're visiting someone's garden, it's a very close, personal, intimate experience because it really is a reflection of who that person is. And I think that's why so many friendships get formed in a garden. In fact, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking to Megan Kane about her garden when she bought her property and 
took over this massively overgrown garden and started shaping it and bringing it to life, that garden became a magnet and people started showing up from all over her neighborhood and she started to make friends. And I think that's one of the reasons gardening becomes such a powerful pastime for so many of us. Those social connections become something of a glue that keeps us gardening because we form friends around gardening and we nurture those friendships in the same way that we nurture our garden. I'm such a huge believer in visiting gardens to help yourself grow as a gardener because gardens are stories and stories are the best way that we learn. So if you think about going through a garden with even a friend, a garden you know well, it's inevitably going to lead to some storytelling as the gardener begins to tell you how that garden was created or the things that they're thinking of doing, their dreams for their garden, what they want it to be, how it looked yesterday, and how it will look tomorrow. And they can tell you what they love in their garden and what they've learned from their garden. And it's through the telling of those stories that we grow. So every time you hear another gardener share their story of their garden, we grow. And every time you share a story of your garden, you're also growing. So for me, after love day, dream days in the garden are very important because those are the days that are devoted to the future of my garden. So whether I'm visiting other gardens or I'm doing a continuing ed class or I'm just reading a book about gardening or flipping through the pages of a very inspirational magazine, all of those are dream day activities for me to help my garden grow. So there you have it. The second way to amp up your gardening skills is to be more strategic with your time, to not just go out to the garden without any thought in mind around what you're going to do or what you might end up doing, but to be very strategic, to be very laser focused on your activity for the day in the garden. So whether it's a weed day, a seed day, a love day, a lug day, or a dream day in the garden, You're going out there with intent on these specific days. Not to say that you won't have days where you just go on out and do whatever captures your fancy, but that you have some days in your garden this year that have a predefined purpose. And you can create your own categories. You don't have to use mine, but hopefully they'll give you an idea and spark some thinking around how you want to use your time in the garden this year. All right, so just a little roadmap here. The first way we amped up our gardening skills was by creating that map, that bigger picture focus of our garden. The second way was to be strategic about our time, having designated purposes in our garden for when we're out there, how we're spending that precious amount of time we have in our garden. The third way I think you can amp up your gardening skills is by getting help. Now, this might initially make you chuckle and you might be thinking, how can getting help actually amp up my garden skills? Let me give you some examples. First, I'd love to encourage you to get kids involved in your garden. I think this is so important. It's a passion project of mine. As a mom of four teenagers, I want my kids to spend time in the garden. Now, here's a creative way that I think you can incorporate kids into your garden that can actually be very useful to you. And it's often one of the ways I vet kids to see if they would be a great student gardener in my garden. And by the way, if you're interested in lining kids up to help you in your garden this year... Now's the time to do that. Get on social media, share a post, indicate that you're looking for help in the garden and you'd like some kids to help you, and then get that on social media. Because I guarantee you, their mothers are going to see that post and want their kids to get a job this summer. And it's a great job because it's so flexible in terms of working around their activities. But here's an activity you can have kids do that I think is enormously helpful to most gardeners, and that is their first assignment is to come and take pictures of your garden. Now, here's how I do it. Oftentimes, if I have a kid that wants to work in my garden to be one of my student gardeners, I'll have them show up with their phone in hand, 
and send them out into the garden to take pictures. And I'll say something like, okay, go shoot 100 pictures of my garden and then come on back. I want to take a look at them. So after they've gone through the garden and they've taken a ton of pictures, I go through their pictures. And as I'm going through them, I'm giving them feedback. Ooh, I really like this one. That was a great perspective. Oh my gosh, I would have never thought to take a picture of this. Thank you for doing that, that type of thing. And then I offer some suggestions and I send them out again. So this time I might say, okay, go out to the garden. And this time I want you to do only wide shots, big shots from every possible angle of all the different garden spaces on the property. So then they go out and they take wide shots. Then I'll say, okay, now I want you to go out and take pictures of all of the structures in the garden. So if you see something made of wood or made of metal, I want you to go take a picture of it. And then they go out and they do that. Okay, all right, great. Now I want you to go out and take a picture of the 10 plants that you think are the most captivating. So if you go to the garden and you kind of squint your eyes and you look at the garden space, what plant immediately pops out to you? It might be a plant that's really colorful. It might be a plant that's really tall. It might be a plant that is uh, very striking with the foliage, something like that. And then I'll say, take a picture of those and come back. And every time they come back with those photos, they're learning how to see the garden in more sophisticated ways than when they first arrived on the property. And then what we do is we do an airdrop. So they take their iPhone and they literally send me all the pictures that they just took of my garden. And I might end up with 200 pictures that I would have never taken on my own had I gone out to the garden because, of course, they see the garden through an entirely different perspective. It's their own perspective. And I so appreciate those pictures. So that's a great way to start to build a relationship with your student gardeners, just by having them come to your property once a week, twice a month, whatever works for you, and have them go and take pictures and then share them with you. If you have an iPhone, they can do an airdrop and then you'll have all of them on your device. Or they can email them to you or you could put them in a Dropbox account. There's a number of ways they can get the pictures to you. And if you don't know how to do it, I bet that they know how to do it. So they'll be able to get them to you. But whenever I have student gardeners working in my garden, it's the very last thing they do. I send them out to the garden and I have them take pictures of the things that they worked on that day. It helps them appreciate the progress that's being made. It helps them take pride in their work. And it helps me in so many ways because throughout the year, I can go back and look at those pictures and see my garden from a number of different perspectives. It's absolutely invaluable. So if you're looking for student gardeners, why not put out the word and then say, hey, guys, you know what? We're going to begin by just having you take pictures in the garden. So come on over. I'm going to pay you 10 bucks a month. And all I want you to do or 20 bucks a month, whatever it is, I want you to come over to my garden and just take pictures and then send them to me. That's it. That's the first assignment. Let's start there. By doing that, you're kind of calibrating with them, how you want them to work in your garden, how you want them to see the garden. And you're also setting up that expectation that as they're working in the garden with you, you're going to be giving them feedback along the way. So that's a great example of getting help in the garden to help you become a better gardener, to help you grow your garden skills, because all of a sudden you're going to have a ton of garden photography. And this is an area that most gardeners need help with. In fact, we beat ourselves up over it. Oh my gosh, I didn't take any pictures of my garden. I didn't take any pictures of this project. If you have a project happening on your property this summer and you want to document how that project evolved over time, have a kid come by and take pictures with their phone and challenge them to take a certain number of pictures. So sometimes I have student gardeners that are maybe a little less exuberant about taking pictures 
but they take good pictures. They just don't take that many of them. And I, I like quantity. So then I'll say, okay, go take pictures. Go out and take 100 pictures and then come back to me. So they know that I'm expecting a large number of pictures. And then the second thing is your feedback is so important to them. So that's really going to help them learn how to take the pictures that you are going to value the most. So I'll give you an example. One time I was working with my student gardeners, this was very early on in the season, and they were just learning how to do this photography business that I was, you know, having them all do at the end of working for me in the garden. And so they get all the way done, and then they looked at me, and I said, okay, go out and take pictures, then I'm going to look at your pictures, I'm going to give you feedback, and we'll go from there. And I said, go make, go make sure you take pictures of the things that you did in the garden today. So they all went around, they took pictures of the things they had worked on. And when I was going through one of the boy's pictures, here he had taken a picture of the inside of the garbage can because that's where he'd thrown some things away. And I said, okay, dude, I do not need a picture of the inside of my garbage can. I mean, yes, that is definitely something that you worked on today, but it's not helpful to me to have a picture of the inside of my garbage can. So again, it's that little corrective feedback when you're working with kids. They take you so literally. They'll do exactly, exactly to the T what you ask them to go and do. But that feedback, that coaching that you give them at the end of it is even more important because that's where the real value comes because they learn what you're expecting and you're learning what's helping you, how to see your garden in new ways. So it's a great way to start to build rapport with your student gardeners. It's a great helpful activity that most gardeners wish they did more of. And the kids are thrilled because they really feel like they're doing something that's valuable and it's cool. They're getting a job where they get to take pictures. That's pretty cool for a kid. And for you, the gardener, you get to have a couple of hundred pictures of your garden taken every single week or every other week, however you line that up. But let's just say you had two kids come over every single week and rain or shine, they went out to the garden and they took each of them 200 pictures of your garden, which doesn't have to take a long time. The kids are pretty quick, but they can go around and take those pictures and then they airdrop them and you have them at the end of every single month in your growing season, you have almost a thousand pictures every single month of your garden. And I'm telling you, that is massively helpful, not only during the season, but in the off season when you're planning and trying to remember how you had things set up in your garden. And I also want to emphasize how important it is to have that fresh perspective, that unique perspective. And even though they're kids, even though they're teenagers taking pictures of their garden, they are, for the most part, very unbiased. They're very untainted. They aren't looking at your garden with a critical eye. They're looking at your garden with an eye for beauty, with an eye for something that's capturing their attention. And how many times have you heard the saying that you need to look at your garden with fresh eyes in order to keep it artistically alive? Probably pretty often. And if you've ever hosted a garden tour or a garden open day, you're probably acutely aware of the things that people find interesting or artistically beautiful in your garden. And oftentimes, it has nothing to do with the thing that you're the most proud of in your garden. Sometimes those things get overlooked, and it's the things that you undervalue that people are completely blown away with. So one thing that I have found amazingly helpful with regard to these pictures is not only the fact that that fresh eye is looking at my garden, but also how they see the garden evolve over time through those images. 
and through a variety of perspectives. So if you have only ever hired one kid to help you in your garden, I'd encourage you to reach out and try to have two kids come through. This is a job where maybe you pay them 20 bucks a month and they just come and take pictures of your garden. They'd be thrilled. They could go out to coffee with their friend and take pictures. They'd think that's amazing. And you reap the benefits of that. You get the fresh perspective and the photos. And if you have multiple photographers, you end up with multiple perspectives, and all of that is a value add to the gardener. I can't tell you precisely how all of your photos are going to translate into having an effect on your garden, but I do know that they will give you an appreciation of some of the feelings and ideas that will leave kind of a footprint into how you think about your garden and how you might change it over time. And when it does change, those photos will be a record of your garden growth and your growth as a gardener. And those are all things that are worth archiving. All right, so in terms of getting help, we've covered kids, getting kids to come and take pictures. That's a great first step. I have an upcoming show where I'm talking about how I utilize student gardeners in my garden to help me. So I won't get into all of that right now. Just trust me that that's coming out here shortly within the next month. But another key thing that you need to be thinking about right now in February is contractors. So when you're thinking about your 2017 garden and you're trying to plan what you're going to do, I'd like you to reach out right now to contractors to work on those bigger projects that you might be planning because now is the time. If you wait until April or even late March when other people will start to think about what they're doing, you're going to find that your project will not get addressed until after the 4th of July. And that's never fun to have a garden project that doesn't get addressed till the end of the season because you really miss out on a full season's worth of enjoyment. You have to wait until the following year. So get those contractors contacted early and make sure that you tell them you have a deadline. And I always love to tell them that it needs to be done by the 4th of July for such and such reason. You want to make sure that your project is one of the very first projects that they get to in the season because once they start to fall behind, it becomes a domino effect and your project will continue to get pushed out. And there have been years in my lifetime when a project you know, that's outside in the garden gets pushed out to the point where you just don't even do it that year. You end up waiting a whole nother year and now you're looking at a couple of seasons worth of delay in terms of being able to enjoy that project. So that's never fun. Now, how can getting contractors on your site to do that work help you grow as a gardener? Well, first of all, I think it helps you get very clear about what it is you want to do in your garden. Because when you're putting money into your garden, you're investing in that, you're going to be a little more thoughtful than just any type of casual garden project. The second thing is, is again, perspective. You're bringing a subject matter expert in onto your location to look at your project. And invariably, people have their own ideas and their own suggestions, which you might incorporate or you might discard. But either way, you're collaborating with them on this project. And that never fails to help you grow as a gardener. So I think the sweet spot is right now to reach out to contractors. In fact, pause this episode and get calling some contractors. I've had great luck looking for contractors through Angie's List. If you haven't used that before, give that a try. Or if you just don't even know where to begin, Angie's List, I think, is a great place to go to try to find good contractors. Now, my last suggestion in terms of getting help is one I'm very passionate about and I use in my own garden all of the time. In fact, I train and certify my student gardeners on it, and that is drip irrigation. It's a way to get help in your garden that doesn't involve other people once it gets going. In fact, it allows you to leave your property and know that it's going to get taken care of because that drip is on an automated timer and you don't have to worry about it. I have so many 
things on my property that require watering, whether it's a container or a fountain or some type of water feature, and all of those things are fully taken care of by my drip irrigation. So once you get that set up, that's the equivalent of getting help in the garden. I can go on vacation in the summer and I don't have to worry that things are not going to get watered. And if you can take the time to learn a little bit about drip irrigation, I think you'll find that it's very much like Legos to me. I think about it in terms of Legos because there's little pieces and parts that all clip together and it is just not hard. You know, you used to have to get that stuff through some type of specialty store or a hardware store and There would be a limited number of parts and pieces. Now you can get everything through the big box stores. Sometimes when my sprinkler guy comes out, I like some of the commercial grade stuff better and I will get that directly from my irrigation people. But for the most part, everything I need, I can get at the big box stores. And it is so wonderful from making sure that my hanging baskets are getting watered to putting a mister over the arch of my arbor so that when it's super hot in July and people walk under my arbor, they get a light misting. They love that. The kids go back and forth under there. They think it's tremendous. And then I have little misters that are set up over my front porch. So if I'm sitting there and I want to just turn the mister on for a little bit, in the hottest, hottest part of the summer, I have the ability to do that as well. So there are so many fun attachments now that you can add to drip irrigation. And if you have a built-in sprinkler system and you want to install some type of drip irrigation, it is so easy to take one of those sprinkler heads and turn it into drip irrigation. It's just not even funny. So if you have that set up, and you don't know where to start, have a sprinkler guy come out or start watching some videos on YouTube. It's so easy. It really is one of the most wonderful ways to get help in your garden. And mastering drip irrigation is a skill that I think every gardener should know. And once again, the easier we can make gardening, the more you're going to enjoy it and the more you can have love days in your garden. All right, my last suggestion in terms of getting help as a way to amp up your gardening skills is to have an open day. And this is an open day where you invite your friends, your garden friends, maybe some family members to come to your garden and just offer a critique of your garden. And if you just suggest to people that they come and enjoy your garden, they would happily do that. If you ask people to come and critique your garden, most people will not want to do that because they won't want to offend you. So what I do is I say, come on over. I'm having a garden party. We'll have some hors d'oeuvres. We'll have a little wine and we'll just sit around and chat. Or maybe maybe I'll have my book club come over and we'll do the same thing. But the key difference is, I will hand them a little sheet of paper and the little sheet of paper will take them on a quick tour of my garden. In fact, maybe I'll include a little snippet of that map picture that I took earlier. And on that map picture, I'll have designated four trouble spots, one, two, three, four. And then I will say, please go to these areas on the map and share your impressions or give me a suggestion. What do you like? What don't you like? What do you think I should do in this area? And if you give people a way to give feedback that doesn't feel confrontational, where they don't have to say it to your face right in the moment, and you're making it more like a homework assignment, I find people are way more generous with information that way. And who better to really tell you what they're thinking than some garden friends. In fact, you could do that for each other. So especially if you've got a spot you just don't even know what to do, you can get a lot of ideas very quickly by getting help from your garden friends, just hosting some type of event where they come to your garden and you guys hang out and then you talk about these spaces. And I guarantee you there'll be something in one of those suggestions that's just going to strike a chord with you, and it'll be the solution that you're looking for. And if it's not, it'll be the beginning of the solution that you're looking for. So that wraps up getting help and why that's important to amping up your skills in the garden. 
Now, the fourth way I'd like to suggest that you amp up your gardening skills is to read things that are outside of the gardening bubble. They're on the periphery and step into someone else's area of expertise that kind of touches on gardening. This is just about the shortest cut I know to recharging your gardening creativity. And I love books that have one foot in the garden and the other in an area that complements the garden well. So cookbooks are a great example, especially cookbooks that acknowledge the garden. Okay, so I'm going to share with you my favorites, the things that are inspiring me for my 2017 garden. The first is a book by Ilona Oppenheim. I love that name, Ilona, and it's spelled I-L-O-N-A. And she's written a cookbook that's called Savor, Rustic Recipes Inspired by Forest, Field, and Farm. And by the way, I have a deep preference for cookbooks with gorgeous covers, and all of these fit that criteria. And this one by Ilona is absolutely beautiful. So the cookbook is called Savor, and the New York Times says it's gorgeous. It's a treat even if you don't feel like cooking. And right in the description, it says, Experiencing the bounty of nature is one of life's greatest joys, foraging, gardening, fishing, and cooking, whether indoors or outside. So Ilona lives in Aspen, Colorado, and she creates recipes that make the best use of her surroundings. So she incorporates things like foraged mushrooms and berries, fresh fish, home-milled flowers, Her book has a very romantic feel, and it says right in the description that it's a delicious portrayal of living in harmony with nature that will appeal to gardeners, gatherers, foragers, and home cooks. So this is a perfect cookbook for gardeners to draw inspiration from for their 2017 gardens. Now, I went out to Ilona's website, which is absolutely gorgeous, so just go to ilonaoppenheim.com. Her cookbook is mentioned there, and then she features some of her recipes. I'm going to share some of them with you here. She's got a rhubarb compote, easy kale salad. Megan Kane would love that. Trout almondine, chestnut pancakes. I'm coming over for breakfast, Ilona. Caramelized onion tart. That is right up Anna Thomas's alley. Some type of summer fruit recipe I can't even pronounce, but it looks amazing. A nourishing bone broth, forest pine nut cookies, holy smokes, and homemade cornbread, just to name a few. Ilona grew up in Europe, in Switzerland, surrounded by farms that provided her family with food. And she says right in her bio that when she came across Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma, that it really changed her life, that she began to understand the consequences of what we actually put in our bodies. And at the time, she was pregnant, and so she was beginning this journey of starting to pursue a wholesome and healthy diet. And she began by exploring local farmer's markets. She's not a trained chef. She's a home chef, but she loves to cook for her family and friends. So she has that in common with Anna Thomas as well. So her cookbook, Savor the World, shows an attainable, wholesome lifestyle And she ends her bio by saying, connect to the land wherever you are. So this is perfect for gardeners. Now, I bought this book on Amazon for a little over $18. I think I got a used copy. So it's very affordable. The second cookbook I would highly recommend this spring is The Vegetable Butcher, How to Slice, Prep, Dice, and Masterfully Cook Vegetables from Artichokes to Zucchini. And it's by Cara Mangini. And I love in Kara's bio, it says that her last name, Mangini, loosely translates to little eater in Italian. And she says right in her bio, was that a sign she was destined to be dedicating her career to food? She thinks so. She grew up in San Francisco in a family that loved to cook. She says her vision for vegetables came into focus while working in the Napa Valley at a farm. She's cooked in France, Italy, and Turkey. And in 2012, she moved to Columbus, Ohio. So she's in the heartland of the United States. 
And in Columbus, she launched Little Eater. It's a pop-up seasonal restaurant, and she packages vegetable salads sold year-round. Now, this book is loaded with photos, and it's very smartly designed. Publishers Weekly says you will come away with plenty of new techniques and tips for breaking down artichokes, conquering the fear of prepping nettles in order to prepare nettle, pesto, and ricotta crostini, and prepping beets. And Amanda Cohen of Dirty Candy said that the vegetable butcher is a butchery bible and vegetable boot camp all in one. So it's another great cookbook for gardeners. Now, I was able to get this cookbook on Amazon for a little over $13 in the used section. And again, it has another beautiful cover. Car is standing behind a table and the table is loaded with vegetables. Now, the last cookbook that caught my attention that I think is absolutely beautiful and has a wonderful cover that's loaded with vegetables is a cookbook called Natural, Wholesome Recipes for Pure Nourishment. Now, this is a beautiful cookbook with a gorgeous cover, lots of vegetables on the cover, including radish, peas, and carrots. And it looks like it's got a little lace across the cover. That's just how the book was designed. It's very pretty, very cute, very romantic feeling. And again, I got a used version of this book on Amazon for a little over $20. All right. And then remember earlier in the show, I talked about that cute little book called Instant Karma. It's 8,879 ways to give yourself and others good fortune right now. And it's by Barbara Ann Kipfer. It's a wonderful little book. It's a cute little coffee table book. It's loaded with ideas. It's very happy looking. The cover is this beautiful, like a lemon yellow with sky blue writing. It's just very, very pretty. And get this, there are used copies on Amazon right now for a penny. So I ordered mine for a penny and I'm thrilled to have it. 8,879 ideas for instant karma. And a lot of those ideas I'm going to incorporate into my love days in the garden. So I'm really excited about this one. And then the last little book is called Fine Little Day, Ideas, Collections, and Interiors. And this is by Elizabeth Dunker. Now, Fine Little Day is a blog that was created, and the blog inspired this book. Now, as a blogger, Elizabeth is sharing inspiring images for everything that brings her joy. She's got these really wonderful collections that she has in her studio, everything from baskets to Scandinavian China. And after she's showing us her home in the city, she takes us out to her cabin in the woods with all of these gorgeous atmospheric photos and even more decorating ideas. So this is a very cute little book. And I got it on Amazon used for under $10. Oop, and then I almost forgot. I have one other cookbook for you. I just about forgot this one. I can't believe it. It's really great. It's called Nordic Light, Lighter Everyday Eating from a Scandinavian Kitchen. This one I absolutely loved. In fact, the minute I saw this book, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's for my mom for her birthday. So I got myself a copy and then I got my mom a copy. So I'm hoping she's not listening to this episode. But it's a gorgeous cookbook. And it's filled with Scandinavian recipes and techniques. They're very light. They're very clean, modern recipes. And they focus on fresh produce and vegetables. Again, another cookbook that's really geared toward gardeners. And this goes right along with the conversation I had with Megan Kane about reverse engineering our gardening, about thinking about the recipes that we want to make, and then growing produce and vegetables in our garden that supports those recipes. Because when our gardens are not recipe-driven, we run the risk of having all of that hard work go completely to waste. And I think it causes a little more anxiety about what are we going to do with all of that? Whereas if we have recipes or go-to dishes that will fully utilize all of that work in production, it's much more gratifying. So Nordic Light by Simon Bayada rounds out this suggestion for the books that you can read to amp up your gardening skills this spring. My fifth way to amp up your gardening skills is to pick some signature themes and priorities to work around for 2017. 
My personal method for doing this is to comb through all of my gardening magazines. And as I do that in the off season, I tear out the pages that speak to me the most, and then I stick them in a three ring binder. And as gardening season draws closer, I begin to go back through those articles. And the ones that are absolute yeses in my mind are the things that I will really focus on for the year. And the other ones that maybe take a back seat completely get tossed out. So I really focus on the things that very much resonate with me, and then I just go for those items. So for you, that might mean picking a signature plant that you want to work with or a key project in your yard, a signature color. I've worked with a friend in the past who really wanted to hone her color palette in her garden. So if that's the case, get started in one section of your garden and then slowly work around. Maybe this year it's all about the front garden and getting the that color palette narrowed down to two or three colors. Maybe it's specializing in a certain type of veggie. Instead of having more diversity, it's more specialization in your garden in terms of edibles. Maybe it's making sure that your garden has a signature plant. I know when I first started gardening, I loved hens and chicks because my grandmother had so many hens and chicks when I was growing up and I'd go to visit her. And I wanted to have that plant all around my garden so that when people came to my garden on that very first garden tour, they would say, oh, that's the hens and chicks lady. So I wanted that plant to be a very renowned part of visiting my garden. You know, a couple of years ago, I worked on having kind of a signature look and I tied it all together with terracotta pots. I'd stumbled on this garage sale where two guys were getting rid of over 200 terracotta pots, and I think I got them all for less than $40. So I came home with all of this pottery, and I phased out all of my different colored pots that weren't very unified in the garden. And now going to this terracotta palette has really given my garden kind of a signature look. And then I do things with those terracotta pots to make them my own, such as lining the interior of each of them with burlap and then tying a small piece of twine on the outside of the terracotta pot. It's a look that when someone sees the pot like that, they know immediately that it's from my garden. The burlap makes sure that when I stack the terracotta pots, they don't stick together. And the simple twine string that's tied on the outside of the pot just makes it look a little more dressed up, like it's going to church. So sometimes you don't know heading into any particular garden season what you want your signature look to be. And that's where combing through magazines or looking at other people's gardens or going through cookbooks even can provide you that inspiration. And when I go through all of my magazine tear sheets, I'm starting to be able to identify those trends, those things that seem to speak to me over and over and over again. And that's how I came to my terracotta pot collection, because I kept tearing out magazine articles. And the one thing that I noticed when I laid them all out was how prevalent terracotta pots figured into those compositions. And you can do the same thing. Start taking notice of the things that speak to you, the images in garden design that speak to you. So whatever it is, look for those things and then go for it. Tie it into your garden. You know, Pam Pennick, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago on the 27th of January with episode 555, she's the author of The Water Saving Garden. She also blogs at her blog called Digging. So if you want to find it, it's pennick.net, P-E-N-I-C-K.net. She recently shared a blog post on February 11th that I thought was really great for exactly this reason, this thing that we're talking about right now about picking a signature theme or a priority to work around for your garden this year. So 
check that out if you want just a nice idea of some good inspiration, kind of a springboard into either a fresh idea for your garden or a way to spruce things up. Here's what Pam wrote about. She had a tree that had died, and that is always a sad thing, but it created a new opportunity for her to redesign her front entryway, this opening to her garden. And what she did is she created kind of a half moon sedge lawnette. I love that term lawnette that Pam came up with. And what she did is she ripped out all of the old stuff, the tree and and some of the soil, and she hired a landscaper to dig out the grass and then spread several inches of this wonderful organic mix into uh, the soil. And then what happened is she installed evergreen Scots turf sedge from a nursery. And she says that when it fills in, it will be a meadowy kind of lawn that doesn't require mowing, edging, or nearly as much water. Now, when I shared this post in the group, people were getting excited and they started sharing it with their friends as well because this is the kind of project that's completely doable and it can be the springboard to your signature look in your garden. And the other thing that she included in this post is the fact that she did a freshen up of her dry stream. And that's another thing that you can do this year. Your signature thing could be It's a refresh and a reset on some of the design elements that are maybe just a little tired in your garden or just need a little bit of time and attention from you. So we started this whole show out by talking about how what we attend to, you know, tends to flourish. So if you have areas that are tired or just needing a little more attention, then by all means, make time for that this year because sometimes even just a freshen up or just the tiniest little redo can make a huge difference in your garden. Well, that's it, you guys. That is my five ways that I wanted to share with you to amp up your gardening skills this year. Again, just a refresh. Start by creating a map. Be strategic about your time. That was number two. So designate certain days in your garden. You can have freewheeling days as well. But by designating targeted activity days in your garden, I think you'll find you get a lot more done. And if you make time to have some love days and dream days in your garden, I think you'll find it'll be more fulfilling for you. Get help. Help can make a huge difference. And help helps you grow as well. So never dismiss help as kind of a cop-out, as a way to, you know, not really put in the work in your garden. I find that to be completely contrary for me. When I get help, I have to step up my game. I have to get very clear about the things that I want to accomplish in the garden. And I end up going on a little bit of a journey of discovery. When you have to incorporate ideas from other people, that's invariably what happens is you grow from that experience. Number four, don't forget to read books that are on maybe the periphery of the gardening space. Those books a lot of times will pull gardening into those trends. That's exactly what we talked about with Katie Dubow when we did the 2017 Garden Trends Report. It's exactly how they help predict some of the trends that gardening will be turning to because We sometimes follow the lead of other disciplines. And then finally, pick some signature themes and priorities to work around for your garden this year, and then just stick to those. You'll feel a greater sense of accomplishment, and all the while, you'll be amping up your garden skills. Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank my wonderful team at Podfly Productions because I tell you what, you guys, I got about halfway through this episode and I lost all of my audio. So my wonderful editor, David Myers, is really saving my bacon this week. So hats off to David. Let's give him a round of applause. And then I want to thank Ayn Kadina. She is my copywriter and David Gregerson, my project manager. He's the man who makes it all happen. So just a reminder that I'll have all of the information that I shared today. I'll have all the links to everything I shared on my website. That's over at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And the show notes for this episode will be right in the, the on the website. So all you have to do is go to the menu and look in the menu and you'll see the word podcast. 
click there and today's episode will pop right up. The other thing that's in the menu that you might want to pay attention to is the fact that the Facebook group has a link right there. So if you're struggling to find it in Facebook and Facebook can be a little bit of a maze, go ahead, just go to my website, sixfootmama.com, click on the Facebook link right there. And that is the Facebook group for the show. It's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. You can click on that link. It'll take you right to the group. And then at that point, just request to join. And then as soon as I see it, I'll let you into the group and you'll be there. You'll be right where you need to be to get all of the information that I share in the Garden News Roundup every week, in addition to all of the other articles and good things that I find to share with you. And I would love to continue the conversation with you as well. So would love to see your garden, would love to hear about your garden challenges, and would love to help you connect with resources and inspire you to find solutions that are life-giving to you. This week, I'm interviewing Josh Volk. He runs Slow Hand Farm, and he also is the author of the book Compact Farms, 15 Proven Plans for Market Farms on Five Acres or Less. I have fallen in love with this book, and it is the book I've picked for the March Book Club. Next week, I will reveal everything about the book club, and hopefully you can join that as well. In the meantime, get working on amping up your gardening skills. Find a way to get outside this week a little bit and have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.